So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, as Lisa said, my name is Barry Whaley. I work for the Southeast ADA Center. We are a project of the Burton Blatt Institute at Syracuse University. Uh, BBI is a disability research law and policy center within uh, the College of Law at Syracuse. And, and we exist to reach around the world in efforts to advance civic, economic, and social participation of people with disabilities. Our institute is named in honor of Burton Blatt. Burton Blatt was the beloved dean at Syracuse University and was a pioneer in the disability rights movement. So we're here today in celebration of the 32nd anniversary of the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, and our topic for today are heroes. So I wanna begin by asking you a question. Who are your heroes? Who are the people or the person that maybe helped you see the world differently to do things perhaps you didn't think you could do? Who are the people you admire? Now, obviously that includes people within our family, but, but, but think in larger terms, who are those people who inspired us? So when I was very young, my first hero, like a lot of other young kids, was Superman. Superman was invincible, except for the whole kryptonite thing. And he was always there at the right time, the right moment to save the world. As I started to grow up, my hero became Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali truly was the greatest of all time and one of the most significant personalities in our culture. Ali was not only a prize fighter, but he also fought prejudice. Prejudice not only for the color of his skin, but religious prejudice. Muhammad Ali lived by six core principles, confidence, conviction, dedication, giving, respect, and spirituality. And, you know, despite that public persona that he had, the, you know, the Louisville lip, the braggadocious um, uh, young guy. If you ever had the chance to meet Muhammad Ali, he was a very humble man. I remember when I was a kid and Muhammad Ali lost to Joe Frazier in the fight of the century. I'm listening on a transistor radio laying in my bed and I cried. And I cried because I expected Muhammad Ali to be just as invincible as Superman. So we can't talk about heroes today unless we, we talk about these heroes, the medical staff, the doctors, the nurses, first responders, epidemiologists, and researchers that are working to defeat the pandemic, to defeat a virus that, desperately, that dis disparately affects people with disabilities and older adults. So as I said, today our theme is heroes, and I want to introduce you to some of my other heroes. And these are heroes and events that shape the disability rights movement. Why is this important? As the great historian and writer David McCullough has said, how do we know who we are and where we're going if we don't know anything about where we have come from, what we've been through, the courage shown, the cost paid to be where we are? That's from McCullough's book. It's my first book recommendation for you today from the book, Brave Companions, Portraits in History. So what this quote reminds us of is that the disability rights movement has always been one of constant struggle for equality and basic human dignity. So before we talk more about my heroes, let's take a look over the last hundred years at some of the important milestones in the disability rights movement. In 1917, we see the first Vocational Rehabilitation Act, the Smith-Hughes Act, to provide rehabilitation services for disabled veterans who were, turn, who were returning from World War I. 1920, we see vocational rehabilitation extended to the civilian population via the Fess Smith Act. In 1933, Franklin Roosevelt becomes president. He's the first US president with an obvious disability. And here's my second book recommendation for you. It's called FDR's Splendid Deception, uh, written by Hugh Gallagher. And FDR's Splendid Deception explains the links to which 
Roosevelt, his son Elliot, and others within the administration went to, uh, to mask Roosevelt's disability for fear of being seen less than or incapable. In 1935, we see the League of the Physically Handicapped form. And why was the League formed? Let's think about the historical context. We're in the midst of the Great Depression. Roosevelt is elected to bring us out of the Great Depression. One of his first programs is the Works Progress Administration, a program formed by a president with a physical disability did not employ people with disabilities. That's why the League was formed. To, to bring attention to that. In 1938, we see the Fair Labor Standards Act, which does a lot of good things, right? It establishes a minimum wage. It provides for overtime pay. It ends child labor, but it has this curious provision that at the time was thought to help people with disabilities to find work. And that's a sub uh, 14C sub minimum wage certificate, which allowed employers to pay people with disabilities less than minimum wage. And 14C is still with us today. And what we have learned is, is that 14C, rather than help people with disabilities find jobs, keeps people with disabilities in poverty. In 1940, we see the American Federation of the Physically Handicapped that we know today as AAPD is formed. 1946, the National Mental Health Foundation that we know today as NAMI. And that is the organization that led Harry Truman to signing the first National Mental Health Act. And finally, we need to mention an obscure little summer camp in the Catskills, Camp Jeanette, that would become the epicenter of the disability rights movement in the early to mid 1960s. So I, my first movie recommendation for you, if you have not seen the documentary Crip Camp, C-R-I-P, Crip Camp, it's an absolute must-see uh, documentary that documents the entire disability rights movement. Moving on to more recent times, in 1964, we see the Civil Rights Act that outlaws discrimination based on race, on color, religion, sex, national origin. But what's missing from the Civil Rights Act are those people who would become the largest minority in the country, people with disabilities. In 1972, we see Mills versus DC Board of Education and Park versus Pennsylvania, two court cases regarding public education. But these cases didn't have to do with providing free and appropriate public education for people. No, these cases were rather if students with disabilities should even be taught in a classroom. 1973, we see the Rehabilitation Act that prohibited discrimination on the basis of disability in the programs of the federal government or programs that receive federal financial assistance. 1975, the Education for All Handicapped Children Act that we know today as IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which ensures free and appropriate public education for students. 1978, we see the ADAPT bus uh, protests, which shut down transit systems across the country, but especially in Denver, to bring attention to the inaccessibility of public transit services. 1986, we see the Air Carriers Access Act, which provides for equality of opportunity in air travel. 1988, we see I. King Jordan become the first deaf president of Gallaudet University. So this is important because when you consider that Gallaudet is formed in 1864, right? It is a institution of higher education specifically for the education of people who are deaf or hard of hearing. It took 124 years, not until 1988, for Gallaudet to have their first deaf president. What a statement of ableism that is, that it took 124 years before the first deaf president is named to Gallaudet. And it was not without struggle. 1990, of course, we see the Americans with Disabilities Act signed. And in 1999, possibly the most important um, 
civil rights case, I believe in our lifetime, Olmstead versus LC, that affirmed that unjustified segregation of people with disabilities was a violation not only of Title II of the ADA, but the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. So here's our first video clip. It's a beautiful warm day, July 26, 1990. Here's President H.W. Bush uh, at the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And now I sign legislation which takes a sledgehammer to another wall, one which has one which has for too many generations separated Americans with disabilities from the freedom they could glimpse but not grasp. And once again we rejoice as this barrier falls, proclaiming together we will not accept, we will not excuse, we will not tolerate discrimination in America. So in this picture, we see alongside President Bush, a fellow in the tan suit using a wheelchair, that's Evan Kemp. At the time, he was the director of the EEOC. Behind Evan Kemp is the Reverend Harold Wilkie. To Wilkie's left is Sandra Perino, of the National Council on Disabilities. And to Bush's left, someone who we will discuss more in a few minutes, um, Justin Dart the guy in the cowboy hat. So it's customary at the signing of legislation that when the president signs a bill into law that he gives out ceremonial pens, right? Uh, to, to, to special dignitaries. The Reverend Harold Wilkie is born without arms and in a sublime moment, the Reverend Wilkie accepts his pen from the president with his left foot. We can't talk about disability rights without talking about some pretty dark times. And the first would be the eugenics movement of the 19th and 20th century. Eugenics is the belief that we can improve the quality of the species by encouraging the reproduction of those with perceived positive attributes while discouraging reproduction of people with undesirable traits. Eugenics can be traced back to a guy by the name of Francis Galton uh, came up with eugenics in the late 1880s, 1883 to be exact. And Galton, incidentally, was a cousin of Charles Darwin. So this idea of eugenics, where have we heard this idea of genetic superiority before? Well, certainly the Nazis practiced it in the most abominable way. We have to remember that it came from the West, from, from the West, from the eugenics movement, from, from Galton and practiced in the United States. You know, the Nazis had begun a program um, in 1939, it was called Actian T4. And Actian T4 resulted in the murder of between 275 and 300,000 people with disabilities. The Nazis were influenced by a study by a, a fellow by the name of Uwald Meltzer, who was uh, a superintendent of a psychiatric facility. And, and Meltzer asked parents of people who were imprisoned at that psychiatric facility, would they be okay if their children were euthanized? 73% of parents said that the euthanasia of their children would be okay so long as they didn't know. In the United States, in a form of eugenics, this is Carrie Buck. Carrie Buck was a patient at the Virginia State Colony for Epileptics and Feeble-Minded. In 1924, Virginia had passed a compulsory sterilization law based on eugenics. Buck, in the eyes of the state represented, in their words, a genetic th threat to society. Carrie Buck's mother was a 52-year-old woman who had an intellectual disability. And according to records of the day, she had a record of prostitution and immorality. 
that she had had three children without good knowledge of their paternity. Carrie was one of those children. She was later adopted and attended school for five years. She reached the sixth grade level. But then Buck is sent to the Virginia State Colony after she was de deemed incorrigible, promiscuous, feeble-minded. Why? Because Carrie Buck had given birth to a child out of wedlock. That it wasn't discovered until later was the result of a rape by her adopted mother's nephew. Now, as shocking as that might be, we have to keep in mind that sexual crimes against people with disabilities um, is a very real thing. And certainly today, a 2018 Justice Department data on sex crimes reflects that people with intellectual disabilities, both men and women, were victims of sexual assault at rates seven times more than people without disabilities. So Buck v. Bell went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in an eight to one decision, the court found that forced sterilization was not a violation of the equal protection or the due process clauses of the 14th Amendment. The one dissenting vote was a guy by the name of Pierce Butler. And Butler voted no, not because he believed Kerry Buck had protection under the 14th Amendment, but because Butler was a Catholic and did not believe in birth control. Butler didn't even bother to write a dissenting opinion. In the majority opinion, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who is considered one of our great justices on the court wrote, for the protection and health of the state, that compulsory sterilization was not a violation of due process under the 14th Amendment. Holmes went on to say that in, instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough, referring to Buck, her mother, and Buck's child. So, where does Holmes get this idea of using this term imbecile? It, it certainly is not meant as a disparaging term in the period of Holmes. The term imbecile comes from an archaic theory called mental age theory. And it's a primary feature of the eugenics movement. And it's still with us today. Often you will hear someone say, well, he has the mind of a five-year-old, for instance. So when Holmes is referring to imbeciles, as this chart suggests, he's using mental age theory in his comments. And if you'd like to learn more about mental age theory, uh, a wonderful colleague of mine, her name is Ivanova Smith at the University of Washington, wrote an excellent essay on, on the subject of eugenic, of on mental age theory. So here's a question for you. When did eugenics end? Or, I mean, when did forced sterilization end? 1932, 1947, 1966, 1979, 1979. Folks, I don't, you know, I'm an old guy, right? I was 20 years old when the last forced sterilization of people with disabilities occurred in this country. And what you need to keep in mind is that Buck v. Bell has never been reheard and it's never been overturned. So here's our next hero. This is Ed Roberts. Ed Roberts is the father of the independent living movement. Ed Roberts contracts polio in 1952 or 1953 rather, two years before the Salk and Sabin vaccine was available. He was quadriplegic and he was uh, required to use an iron lung at times during the day to survive. He was denied his high school diploma at first because he was unable to complete physical education or driver's training. He did finally get his uh, diploma on appeal. Ed Roberts is first accepted to um, the University of California at Berkeley. 
but then his acceptance was denied um, because in the words of one Berkeley Dean, we've tried cripples, it didn't work. He was able to enter Berkeley on, ad on advocacy. Interestingly, California Vocational Rehabilitation refused tuition assistance, believing that Ed Roberts had very little expectation or no expectation of employment. Roberts attends, Ber attends Berkeley. Although the dormitories could not accommodate his iron lung, he lived in Crowell Hall, which was the campus hospital. And then other people with disabilities started to live on the campus and in the campus hospital. And Berkeley, as we know, has always been known as a center of activism. So Roberts and, and other students with disabilities formed the Rolling Quads, um, which then later became the Physically Disabled Students Association. And the role of the Rolling Quads was, a pro to, was to advance a program advocating for greater campus and community access. Roberts graduates from Berkeley. He teaches for a while. Then he forms this concept of centers of independent living. And these are centers that are run by people with disabilities, for people with disabilities. And in a moment of poetic justice in 1976, the guy that vocational rehabilitation said had little or no expectation of employment becomes the director of California Vocational Rehabilitation. Here's some video of Ed Roberts. It's contracted polio. After months in the hospital, Roberts returned home paralyzed from the neck down and began the difficult transition into a new life. First of all, I tried to kill myself. Uh, By not eating. But, and you have to be pretty creative when you're paralyzed from the neck down. And you can't even reach out and unplug. So right. Can... Well, and you've got all these nurses and doctors trying to save your life. Around. And so the thing that I chose... Reluctantly sometimes trying to save your life. <laughs> yeah, but... right. <laughs> yeah. The thing that I chose was just, I was not hungry. I starved myself. Roberts ultimately chose to live. He returned to school and began to see the need to advocate for himself as a person with disabilities. He challenged and won against his high school administration when they claimed he could not graduate due to his not taking physical education or driver training. He also challenged the California Department of Rehabilitation and admissions personnel to gain admission to UC Berkeley in 1962. These experiences shaped Roberts and directed him towards advocating for independent living for the disabled. Think about your own life. If you, if you had people taking care of you, making all your decisions, what is there to life, really? And almost all the social programs we set up take care of us or put us away in institutions to be cared for. And I think once I began to discover that, how important it is to, to help yourself and to move on from that and to go beyond what people thought my limits were. At UC Berkeley, Robert studied political science and further developed as a proponent for the civil rights of the disabled. He pushed for the right of achieving personal independence. In 1972, he helped found the Berkeley Center for Independent Living, a revolutionary approach to advocacy for the disabled. Organizations such as this are run by the disabled, and they help clients maintain their daily lives. They work with local governments in promoting accessibility in public spaces and in helping clients develop careers. What we are is not super cripples, but we are role models. We are examples of people who even with the most severe disabilities have been able to, to lead fulfilling lives in the community and work, have families, and overall play significant roles. He also advocated for greater accessibility in public spaces, pushing for the adoption of curb cuts and sidewalks as policy. He invented curb cuts we always tested curb cuts, me and him. I was either riding in his chair, but how sloped was the curb cut? How much of a drop off was there at the end? My father had about eight inches between his battery cell and the ground. If that curb cut wasn't right and it was cut off and down, 
he was going to slam the back of his chair. I mean, curb cuts, I mean, completely utilitarian. I mean, the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Roberts helped found the World Institute on Disability in 1983. In raising awareness on the philosophy of independent living, he traveled to Russia, Australia, Japan, and France to advocate for public policy changes. Roberts passed away in 1995 at the age of 56. His influence continues to be felt nearly 20 years later, as centers for independent living based on his model have opened across the United States and across the world. He is memorialized in places such as the Ed Roberts campus in Berkeley, California, and on Ed Roberts days adopted by the state governments of California and Minnesota. You can't go wrong with your gut. You can't go wrong with your passion. Don't ever settle. He never settled. I'll never settle. I carry that with me every day. And if there's anything he'd love to pass on, it's just go for it. Follow your passions. If that's in the independent living movement, then go for it. Don't settle. Fight for what you want and what you believe in. That's what my father would want. So the Rehabilitation Act becomes the catalyst that sets the stage for an event that we will discuss in a few minutes. The Rehab Act of 1973 is originally vetoed by Richard Nixon, who believed it to be too costly and unenforceable. The Rehab Act becomes the foundational law of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In fact, the definition of disability, which is a social definition, not a medical definition, is the same in the Rehab Act and ADA. There are three sections we want to consider. Section 501 that prohibits disability discrimination in government hiring. Section 503 that prohibits discrimination in hiring by contractors and subcontractors of the federal government. In section 504 that says the programs that receive federal funds cannot discriminate on the basis of disability. There have been amendments to the Rehab Act over the years, several that are very important. 1978 establishes those centers for independent living that Ed Roberts conceptualized, uh, provides funding for those. 1986 uh, supported employment becomes a preferred goal for people with significant disabilities um, and today uh, leads us to the employment first movement that employment uh, that competitive integrated employment should be the first and preferred outcome for people with disabilities and then in 1992 that government that employment was the primary goal of vocational rehabilitation and that applicants were employable unless otherwise, uh, or unless proven otherwise. So my next hero is Mark Gold. In the years before the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act, before there was Mills versus DC Board or Park versus Pennsylvania, there's a teacher in Los Angeles who believed that his students with significant disabilities had hidden potential that was unseen due to the significance of their disability. Mark Gold believed that anybody could learn and that it was our responsibility um, to figure out how to teach people. Gold's concept was that there's more than one way that learning takes place. And that if we break down steps into meaningful, learnable steps, then people, even with the most significant impact of disability, could perform those complex tasks. This is a training method that we know today is systematic instruction that Mark Gold coined as a term, try another way. So why is this important? Well, this is a quantum shift in our understanding. 
we're moving from a medical or from a medical or a custodial care model. Remember Ed Roberts saying a minute ago that the entire sister, sis, service system is designed to take care of us. Well, we hear, here we see Mark Gold saying that we need to move from that custodial care to an, un, to an instructional model. And this is nothing short of revolutionary. Gold changed the belief that people with disabilities were not objects of pity, but people who should be empowered and have dignity and control of their lives. Here's a video of Mark Gold demonstrating, try another way. This is a bicycle brake. Since 1967, when we began this research, it has had a major impact on the development of my philosophy, and on the techniques that have generated from our research. Its principal impact has been to point out the discrepancy between what people think are the capabilities of the severely handicapped, the mild and severely and profoundly retarded, and what they're really capable of doing. The hundreds of people that we've trained on this task, almost 100% of the time, This is Barbara. She's 19 years old and for the last 11 years has lived in an institution. According to her records, her IQ is 11, whatever that means. She's working with this task and with me for the first time. She's more talkative than a lot of the people we work with. It's a pleasure to work with people like this because you can see the growth so fast. You can see changes in their dignity and how they approach the task, how they feel about training. You listen to her complaining here and yet her hands are cooking. Why can't the people we serve have their balances too? Why can't we give them genuine competence? Why can't we give them things that not everyone else has? The answer is, is that we can. As soon as we decide that they have the right to acquire really sophisticated, genuine skills, social skills, self-help skills, academic skills, et cetera, et cetera, then they can have the same chunk of the action that we have. So as I mentioned at the start, I work at the Burton Blatt Institute at Syracuse University and Burton Blatt was a great scholar. He was the Dean of the College of Education at Syracuse. And in 1965, um, he and a fellow by the name of Fred Kaplan found their way into state institutions in New York to photograph the atrocities they saw. Keep in mind the context then that leads Robert Kennedy uh, as Attorney General to tour institutions through New York. And Kennedy said, I think that at the state institution for the mentally retarded, and I think that particularly at Willowbrook, we have a situation that borders on a snake pit and that children live in filth. And many of our fellow citizens suffer tremendously because of a lack of attention, a lack of imagination, a lack of adequate manpower. Keep in mind how, how this must have affected Kennedy because you might recall that his sister Rose had been living in a state facility or in a private institution for over 20 years. So Burton Blatt, Fred Kaplan, they get into the state institutions in New York literally with cameras on their belt buckles and they film what they saw there. And it became a book and this is your next book recommendation. It's called Christmas in Purgatory. And here's some video with, with images from Christmas in Purgatory.
Here's my next hero. This is Roland Johnson. Roland Johnson is a man born with an intellectual disability. He was sent to a state institution, Pennhurst, at age 12 after suffering abuse at home from his mother for behavior that she just didn't understand. Penhurst's history is that when it opened in 1908, it was known as the Eastern State Institution for the Feeble-Minded and the Epileptic. Penhurst was overcrowded when it first opened, and by the time Johnson was sent to the institution, it was overcrowded, understaffed, with 2,800 people in prison there. Roland Johnson was able <clears throat> excuse me, to be liberated from the facility. And he began an organization called Speaking for Ourselves. And he encouraged other people with intellectual disabilities to speak for themselves, to fight for their rights and the rights of others. So my next book recommendation for you is called Lost in a Desert World. It's by Roland Johnson uh, with Carl Williams uh, 2002. After escaping the institution, as I said, he becomes self-advocate and advocated for the liberation of others. Um, he became a nationally known speaker and he would begin his speeches by asking people, who's in control? Who's in control of your life? Tragically, Johnson dies in a house fire at a young age in 19, or when he was 48 years old. Roland Johnson was present on the lawn for the signing of the ADA. And after his death, Nancy Thaler, the Pennsylvania Office of Developmental Programs, was quoted as saying, it's impossible to know the courage of a man who had slung at him the worst labels, insults imaginable, who suffered abuse and neglect, who belonged to a group totally discounted by society, but who nevertheless stood up in public to speak for himself. Roland Johnson gave voice to people. Roland Johnson made us listen. Roland changed how we think about people with disabilities. Now here's one of my great heroes. This is Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer sits at the intersection of ableism and racism. She became an important voice in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Fannie Lou Hamer had polio. She worked as a sharecropper and then as a plantation timekeeper because she was literate. In 1961, she was inspired at a meeting of the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee to take up the cause of voter repression in Mississippi. When she tried to register herself, she was given a literacy test by the clerk. The clerk asked Hamer to interpret a section of the state constitution dealing with de facto laws. Hamer's quoted later as saying, I knew about as much about de facto laws as a horse knows about Christmas Day. She failed the literacy test. She returned to the Marlowe plantation where word had already spread that she was trying to register to vote. And she was fired and told to leave the, Mar the Marlowe plantation that night, the only home Fannie Lou Hamer ever knew. Fannie Lou Hamer is best known for challenging voter suppression and founding the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. She was challenging the all-white Mississippi delegation at the 1964 Democratic Convention. She was asked to come before the Convention Credentialing Committee and testify. There were other people testifying that day before the Credentialing Committee as well. Dr. Martin Luther King, Rita Schwerner, who was the wife of Michael Schwerner, who had been killed just two months prior. You might recall Michael Schwerner's story in the movie Mississippi Burning. Well, Lyndon Johnson was terrified of Fannie Lou Hamer because unlike King or others who could speak secondhand to what they had experienced, Fannie Lou Hamer had, Hainer, Hamer had experienced discrimination, ableism, beatings firsthand. 
So as Hamer begins speaking, Lyndon Johnson, terrified of her, has an impromptu press uh, briefing at the White House. All the cameras leave the credentialing committee. They think that Johnson is going to select his running mate. It turns out to be a bogus news conference. Johnson instead wanted to give an update on the health of John Connolly, but what it did was take away her testimony from the national TV spotlight. When, no, when Martin Luther King accepted the Nobel Peace Prize, he personally thanked Hamer for her discipline, her wise restraint, her majestic courage. In yet another example of eugenics, Hamer was sterilized without her consent in 1961. In 1963, while returning to her home uh, in Rueville from Indianola, Mississippi, she's nearly killed in a Mississippi jail at the hands of police. Here's some video with Fannie Lou Hamer. And they, you know, when I, we walked in, when I walked in with the two white men that had carried me down and they cursed me all the way down, they would ask me questions and when I would try to answer, they would tell me to hush. And I, when, we, when I walked inside of the booking room, one of the policemen went over and jumped up on one of the Negroes' feet that was with us. And then they would just began to, you know, put us in cells. And I was put in a cell with Miss Yvesta Simpson. And after I was put in this cell, I could just hear some horrible screams and horrible sounds, you know, of licks. And I saw one of the girls was 15 years old was with us. And she passed my cell and she was real bloody. And then they asked the little man that clean up the jail to go inside and mop up that blood. And then I heard some more screaming and I heard some awful sounds. And I would hear somebody when they say, can't you say yes, sir, nigga? Can't you say yes, sir? And they would call her names that I wouldn't want to go on tape. And she said, yes, I can say yes, sir. So I said, and she said, I don't know you well enough. And I would hear when she would hit the floor again. And finally she began to pray and she asked God to have mercy on these people because they didn't know what they was doing. And after a while, they passed my cell door with this young woman, Miss Annel Ponder, and one of her eyes looked like blood, and her hair was standing up on her head, and her clothes had been torn from the shoulder down to the waist. And then three white men came to my cell, and one of them was a state highway patrolman because he was wearing a little silver plate across his pocket that said John L. Bassinger. And he asked me where I was from, and I told him I was from Rueville. And he said, I'm going to check that. And he went out, and I guess he called Rueville. And they did, didn't like me in Rueville because I worked with voter registration there. And when he came back, he said, you're damn right. They said, you're from Rueville, all right. And we going to make you wish you was dead. And they led me out of that cell into another cell and he gave a Negro prisoner a blackjack and he ordered me to lay down on the bunk bed. And a Negro prisoner said, do you want me to beat her with this, sir? And he said, you're damn right, because if you don't, you know what I'll do for you. And I laid down on the bunk like he ordered me to do. And the first Negro beat me. He beat me until he was exalted. And after he beat the state highway patrolman, ordered the second Negro to take the blackjack. And during the time he was beating, I began to work my feet because that was a horrible experience. And the State Highway Patrolman ordered the first Negro that had beat to sit on my feet while the second one beat. And I just began to scream where I couldn't control it. And then the white man got up and began to beat me in my head. I have a blood clot now and the artery to the left eye and a permanent kidney injury on the right side from that beat. These are the things that we go through in the state of Mississippi, just trying to be treated like a human being.
Fannie Lou Hamer dies young in 1977. Here's the epitaph on her tombstone. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. Our next hero, truly one of the greatest champions of the disability rights movement is Judy Hume. Judy helped draft the IDEA in 1974, known then as the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act. She was a colleague of Ed Roberts and a founding member of the Berkeley SIL. She went on to found the World Institute on Disability with Ed Roberts, which is a nonprofit that works to integrate people with disabilities into communities around the world via research, policy, and consulting. From 1993 to 20 to 2001, she served in the Clinton administration in OSERS, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services. And she also worked for the World Bank. She was the first advisor on disability and development from 2002 to 2006. And in this position, she led the World Bank's disability work to expand its knowledge and capability to work with governments and civil society on including disability in global conversations. Thinking back to Camp Jeanette, she was one of those campers where she learned and was spurred by her activism in the disability rights movement. She was present at the watershed event of that movement that we'll discuss in a moment. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to speak with Judy several times. She has been our guest on a podcast that we produce called ADA Live. Uh, if you go to adalive.org, you can hear episode 81 with Judy uh, in celebration of uh, the um, uh, celebration of the Olmstead decision. And then um, our most recent episode, episode 107 uh, online this month, uh, Breaking Barriers for Disabilities, Disability Rights, Historical Reflections with Judy Human. So if you'd like to learn more about Judy. And so my next book recommendation for you is a book called Being Human, uh, Judy's uh, Reflections in her autobiography. Here's some video of Judy. I think the real time when I really had to step forward was when I wanted to be a teacher. My written, oral, and medical exam all were given in inaccessible buildings, so clearly we had no ADA or Section 504 at that time. And my friends carried me up and down the steps. And then I was uh, failed on my, my medical exam because I couldn't walk. I started getting letters from people and people would stop me on the street. They wanted to live their life like anybody else. They had significant disabilities, but it was everybody really beginning to demand respect and the right to be able to do with their life what other people do and don't have to think about. Friends of mine and I decided that what we would do is we would take all the people I'd spoken to and letters and invite them to a meeting. And we set up this group called Disabled in Action. So the demonstrations in San Francisco were organized through the coalition. We got inside, we weren't getting the answers we wanted. A couple of us said, we shouldn't leave, we should stay. And so people stayed. The most important part of what was going on was really being on top of uh, the negotiations that were happening, working with the press on a regular basis. You'll hear from people how empowering it was for them to be taking a stand. That was really the beginning of advocacy. For the younger people today, I want them to have a vision, which is dramatic, that really allows them to look at making the same degree of change. So as Judy alluded to um, in, in, in that piece, She's alluding to, in San Francisco, the watershed moment of the disability rights movement. 
and it occurred in April of 1977 when 150 people with disabilities occupied the federal building in San Francisco for 28 days. 28 days. It's the longest occupation of a federal building in U.S. history. So why were they there? They were there because Jimmy Carter's Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, a guy by the name of Joseph Califano, had refused to implement the rules for Section 504 of the Rehab Act. And as you remember from earlier in the presentation, 504 says if you have a disability, you cannot be discriminated against in any program or service that receives federal funds. So I want to spend a few minutes with you and show you this video about the occupation of the federal building. For the time they are a train. We were there because we had to be there. We weren't going to take it anymore. We had to have our civil rights. And they decide to fight for them on April 5th, 1977. Proud and defiant, Five to six hundred people in wheelchairs with walking canes and hearing aids storm the regional office of Health, Education, and Welfare in San Francisco. Their purpose? To stop discrimination against the disabled, no matter what the consequences. Our role that afternoon was to ask the people in the federal bureaucracy to call Washington and press for the signing of 504 as drafted. For the disabled, the signing of Regulation 504 is the difference between living and existing. We're more than handicapped without these laws. We're crippled. 504 means access to public transportation and public spaces. It means free public education and no job discrimination. All basic American civil rights, unless you're like Mary Jane Owen, who cannot see and cannot hear without an aid. The general attitude was, you don't really know what's best for you, and we will do what is right over time. When? When? We're tired. When? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. For thousands of disabled people across the nation, the answer is now. In a grassroots movement, they stage a sit-in at 10 HEW offices across the country. In Washington, protesters put newly appointed Secretary Joseph Califano on the hot seat, demanding he sign 504. I understand how you feel. No, you don't. You're not Within 24 hours, the demonstrators are forced out of the federal building. Everywhere, that is, except San Francisco. Instead of giving in, they move in, in what will become the longest occupation of a federal building in U.S. history. I had a moment of, do I really want to do this? I mean, I was thinking of, you know, some of the, the things that had gone on in the 60s and the fire hoses and the mace cans, and I thought, well, it didn't have that kind of a feeling. Nevertheless, officials try to sabotage the demonstration. The biggest thing was, was that malicious unplugging of motorized wheelchairs at night. Those kinds of things did nothing but make us stronger. We're speaking of something that goes beyond our bodies. Our uh, priorities are not comfort. Our priorities are justice. We shall not be, we shall not be. The community rallies behind the demonstrators as the days pass. The Black Panthers send in cold sandwiches. Others bring in mattresses and a portable shower. The restrooms here are far from accessible to disabled people. They have towel holders that you have to be Wilt Chamberlain to hit. One week into the takeover, some of the demonstrators decide to hammer the point home. They go on a hunger strike. I'm trying to uh, embarrass President Carter on a hunger strike. However, attendant to that is a bit of diarrhea. Yet their spirits are intact. Each morning, Jeff Moyer leads the protesters in song. No amount of singing will change Califano's mind. Ramps and services cost money, lots of it. He has to convince schools, hospitals, and transportation systems to spend it. It doesn't do any good to put out a set of rules if nobody's going to follow them or somebody's going to go to Congress and say, well, I'll get them repealed or changed. Two weeks pass. The deadlock continues. Meanwhile, the difficult living environment is jeopardizing the health of several demonstrators. I'm a spinal cord injury. Someone must turn me during the night. 
Well, often it's, that must be done by a person who has no experience in turning. And it's very painful. There's very little rest at the end of the night. If one of us got weak, then the others gathered around and gave us strength. So we never, we never lost sight of why we were there. How can you ask if I'm happy going my way? You might as well ask a child to play. But just sharing in the ups and the downs. No need to discuss it was, it was just powerful. Powerful enough to cause change, if not politically, then personally. Mary Jane Owen remembers one young woman's wish. If you had asked me two weeks ago, I would have said, I wish I didn't have to be crippled anymore. Because I always wanted to be beautiful and I didn't want to be crippled. And she said, now I know I'm beautiful. You know? Now I know I'm beautiful as I am. I won't ask of myself to become something else. I'll just be me. We're just people. Humanity should rec recognize itself, not its differences. Keep your eye on the prize. Hold on. Hold on, they do. 21 days, 26 days. Then, finally, 28 days later, the prize at last is theirs. The signing of 504, a victory worth fighting for. In the words of Mary Jane Owen, I can see, I can see. Keep your eye on the prize and hold on. So the occupation would never have been possible without support from the outside. And here's my next hero. Brad Lomax is the guy using the wheelchair in this picture along with his brother, Glenn. And Brad Lomax uh, had multiple sclerosis and he was a leader in the black empowerment and the disability rights movement. He was a member of the Black Panthers and a founder of the East Oakland SIL, Center for Independent Living. And it takes a lot to occupy a building for 28 days, right? It takes people on the outside, people like the International Association Machinists, the United Farm Workers, but most importantly, the Black Panthers that delivered each day meals to people within the occupation. He was inside, Brad Lomax was, during the 504 occupation. And his role is he was the one who arranged for those meals each day. So the occupation would have failed without Brad Lomax. Our next hero is Tom Harkin. He's the chief architect of the legislation that became the ADA. Harkin's activism was a result of love for his son or for his brother, Frank. Frank Harkin became deaf after contracting mental, spinal meningitis. In a Senate speech in support of the ADA, Harkin gave his speech both in English and American Sign Language. Senator Harkin has also been a guest on our ADA Live podcast. If you listen, if you go to episode 70, uh, you can hear Senator Harkin discussing Frank and the discrimination that Frank faced throughout his lifetime. Possibly the most important court case, civil rights case in our nation's history, one of is the Olmstead decision. In the Olmstead decision, the Supreme Court ruled that forced institutionalization was a violation of Title II of the ADA and the 14th Amendment. At the center of Olmstead versus Elsie is Lois Curtis, pictured here giving one of her paintings to President Obama. At age 11, Lois Curtis, who had an intellectual and developmental disability, was sent to the Georgia Regional Hospital, where she lived for the next 18 years. In writing for the majority, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, first, institutional placement of persons who can handle and benefit from community settings perpetuates unwarranted assumptions that persons so isolated are incapable or unworthy of participating in community life. Second, that confinement in an institution severely diminishes the everyday life activities of individuals, including family relations, social contact, work options, economic independence, educational advancement, and cultural enrichment. 
So Lois Curtis is liberated. She currently lives in Atlanta. I did have the opportunity. We're doing a, a special website because next year is the anniversary of Section 504. We are doing Section 504 at 50, where we are conducting interviews with key people in the disability rights movement. And just this morning, I had the opportunity to speak with Lois. So I first had this idea to do this presentation in 1919 or in 2019. I'm doing a presentation in Pompano Beach, Florida, and I'm in a room with 200 people. And I like to ask questions, you know, and, and give out some of my boss's book books. So I asked a group of 200 people, who was the guy in the cowboy hat at the signing of the ADA? And I was floored when nobody knew the greatest hero of them all. Justin Dart. Justin Dart was somebody born of privilege. His mother was heir to the Walgreens drug fortune. His father was the president of Rexall Drugs. Dart earned his teaching degree at the University of Houston, but the university had refused to give him his teaching certificate due to his physical disabilities. Dart went on to be the president of Tupperware in Japan, where he instituted a policy of hiring women and people with disabilities. When Tupperware executives told him to stop his disability work, he quit. He returns to the United States and President Reagan selects Justin Dart to be the vice chair of the National Council on Disability. So Dart and his wife Yoshiko begin a listening tour to record stories of disability discrimination and those stories become the impetus for creating the ADA. So whenever you give an address like this, you wanna leave something inspirational for folks, right? Nothing I could say or do would be as inspirational or as powerful as listening to Justin Dart's farewell as he's dying. Free our people! Free our people! Dearly beloved, listen to the heart of this old soldier. As with all of us, the time comes when body and mind are battered and weary. But I do not go quietly into the night. I do not give up struggling to be a responsible contributor to the sacred continuum of human life. I do not give up struggling to overcome my weakness, to conform my life, and that part of my life called death to the great values of the human's dream. Death is not a tragedy. It is not an evil from which we must escape. Death is as natural as birth. Like childbirth, death is often a time of fear and pain, but also of profound beauty, of celebration of the mystery and majesty which is life pushing its horizons toward oneness with the truth of Mother Universe. The days of dying carry a special responsibility. There is a great potential to communicate values in a uniquely powerful way. The person who dies demonstrating for civil rights. Let my final actions, thunder of love, solidarity, protest of empowerment. I adamantly protest the richest culture in the history of the world, a culture which has the obvious potential to carry a golden age of science and democracy dedicated to maximizing the quality of life of every person, but which still squanders the majority of its human and physical capital on modern versions of primitive symbols of power and prestige. I adamantly protest the richest culture in the history of the world, which still incarcerates millions of humans with and without disabilities in barbaric institutions, back rooms, and worse, windowless cells of oppressive perceptions for the lack of the most elementary empowerment supports. 
I call for solidarity among all who love justice, all who love life, to create a revolution that will empower every single human being to govern his or her life, to govern the society, and to be fully productive of life quality for self and for all. I do so love all the patriots of this and every nation who have fought and sacrificed to bring us to the threshold of this beautiful human dream. I do so love America, the beautiful, and our wild, creative, beautiful people. I do so love you, my beautiful colleagues, in the disability and civil rights movement. My relationship with Yoshiko Dart includes, but also transcends, love as the word is normally defined. She is my wife, my partner, my mentor, my leader, and my inspiration to believe that the human dream can live. She is the greatest human being I have ever known. Yoshiko, beloved colleagues, I am the luckiest man in the world to have been associated with you. Thanks to you, I die free. Thanks to you, I die in the joy of struggle. Thanks to you, I die in the beautiful belief that the revolution of empowerment will go on. I love you so much. I'm with you always. Lead on. Lead on. Let us embrace each other in reverence for individual human life. Let us go forward together for however long it takes to create an America that empowers all. So thank you for being with me this afternoon. These are my heroes. As a reminder, um, this project uh, was funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. Um, that is a uh, part of the Administration on Community Living in the Department of Health and Human Services. So with that, Lisa, do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, we mostly have some comments, so I'd like to read a few of those. And thank you, everyone, for hanging in with us. I know this is a little bit more than the hour that we advertised, but I, I hope you, you agree that it was worth spending a little bit more time, and thanks for hanging in with us. Um, so Gary made a comment. Would you also include Section 508 in the year 2000 as a critical step? So I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, Gary. A absolutely. So, so 508 has to do with... Um, digital accessibility. And so when, when we think back to when the ADA is first written, right, in 1990, uh, then amended in 2008, we had no idea that what our current environment would, would look like. So, you know, there's been some concern that the ADA itself does not necessarily um, uh, mention digital accessibility. Certainly it does in Section 508, but we have to remember that time and time again, and most recently this spring, the Department of Justice has said that digital accessibility, uh, internet accessibility um, is, is, um, ne needs to be accessible for all. So we got a comment from Heather saying forced sterilization is actually still happening. So I, I don't know if you have a comment on that. She didn't elaborate, but um, that, that was one comment that we received. Um, excellent material. Thank you for that comment. Um, Gary also writes as uh, an HEW HS, HSS employee. It's sadly ironic when the department takes credit for the Rehabilitation Act. <laughs> Oh. Fair, fair enough, fair enough. Um, he also grew up with parents who worked for Tupperware in the 60s and was familiar with Justin Dart's name. Oh, very good, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, 
Michelle writes, thanks, very interesting. I would note that while this presentation highlights many male disability activists and a few females, there are other women such as Alice Wong, Candace mm -hmm. Cable, Marley Matlin, Linda Bove, Helen Keller, and Mary Kate Callahan, among others. So thank you for those inclusions. Yes, and 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 many of those people, um, you know, several of them, Alice included, will be in our 504 at 50 series. So um, we we have just a, a wonderful group, and you know, sadly, given the time constraints, I can't include everybody. I wanted to include people who, you know, without diminishing the work of Alice and others, the the work that those folks have done. Yes. And let's see, just some thank yous. Um, I learned something I did not know. That's great. Uh, appreciate the comments. This presentation is simply wonderful. It humanizes what we do, or I'm sorry, why we do what we do and how it came to be. Thank you. So appreciate that comment. Um, a series that includes more men and women, more people of color, et cetera, would be amazing. I agree. So, you know, hopefully that's something that can be uh, put together. Um, oh, yeah, and there is a companion um, presentation that I do actually, Lisa, that um, um, only focuses on those people of color who are leaders in the disability rights movement. And I do that presentation in tandem with a former student of mine um, who was an intern from Morehouse College in Atlanta. Uh, and and uh, I, I I'm, I'm reluctant to do that without, his name is Wendell Shelby Wallace. I'm, I'm reluctant to do that without Wendell present. Well, something to talk about, and I, I appreciate the thoughts that, that people gave us on that. And, and just to wrap things up, I do want to apologize for the lack of captioning. I, I so appreciate all of you who pointed out that ironic uh, th thing that uh, you know was, was happening today. Um, I take that to heart and we will look into for future presentations how we can do better with that. So, so thank you for pointing that out. And we will have this presentation posted on the San Diego Law Library YouTube channel um, no later than Monday. And that will uh, afford people the opportunity to watch it with captions. Um, maybe not always completely accurate ones, but, but hopefully helpful captions. So thank you everybody for being here.